Yeah, Amazon is great. definitely blowing up. Oh yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's funny because people often ask the question, is it too late to get in? No, I don't think it'll, I don't know if it ever will be because our economy is forever changing. New brands are always popping up. New products are popping up. New, like there's always things evolving. The biggest change for us this year was, was doing Merchant Fulfilled. So having the, the warehouse is really helpful for that. Welcome fellow entrepreneurs to the Entrepreneur Adventure Podcast, where we talk about Amazon Wholesale and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, or anything in between. And now your host, Todd Welch. All right. So today I have Paul Soche. He is the CEO and founder of FBAinsiders.co and also of Cajun Prep, which is a prep center for wholesalers and private labelers. And of course, he also is in the wholesale world with us and got his start in retail arbitrage. So Paul, I really appreciate you joining us. Why don't you tell us about your backstory a little bit? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on, Todd. Uh, really excited to be here today. Uh, yeah. So I got started selling on Amazon in 2015. Um, and I found it because a friend of mine said, Hey, you're scrappy. I know you like to make money. Uh, why don't I show you how to scan products out of Target? And uh, we'll look at the Amazon seller app. And that, that's kind of how it got started. I, at that time, I had a landscape company. Um, my background is in landscaping. Uh, agriculture and things like that. And, uh, and at that time, my wife just got pregnant with our first kid. And, uh, and so I had a nine month window <laughs> to figure this Amazon thing out and say, you know, really, I wanted to, I wanted to come home. And so, uh, I just, I hit it hard with retail arbitrage. I was solo. I was getting out there with scanning apps and just learning it doing inventory lab and all the, all these things. Um, and, uh, and so my daughter was born in December. And after that time frame, I was actually able to take off two months of work. And I mean, granted, it was winter, so my landscape company and Amazon was going around the same time and uh, landscape kind of died off. And then Q4 just happened. And I think I sold like 50 grand in that Q4. And I thought I was a millionaire. I was just like, oh my <laughs> gosh, this is incredible. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you know, I, I was doing the hustle. Um, and as time went on, I, uh, ended up buying some coaching from, from some people and learned a uh, wholesale. And I went, I, I dabbled in, in RA and OA for quite some time. And one of the things that I always like to do was, was kind of, was bolt down what I'm currently doing. So <clears throat> with RA, we, you know, I had a team of shoppers. I had probably four to six people at one point running around buying inventory and, and doing all those things. Um, and, and one of the things with, with Amazon selling is, and I, I, I left out this detail. I started selling on Amazon with $300. So I call myself the $300 kid, you know, like, and I still feel like a kid sometimes just playing on the internet, but I slowly built that up. So I turned 300 into 600, 600 into 12. My goal was hundred percent ROI and just kept helping that money over and over. Um, and then, you know, as you grow your capital, it's harder to spend it, right? So that's when you start hiring shoppers if you're doing RA because you need help spending your capital. Um, or, and then I switched to wholesale and realized, wow, I can spend my capital so much quicker by myself or with one other person and not have the big team. And, and it's not that I didn't like the big team. I mean, people ebb and flow, right? In, the, in this world, people come in and out of your businesses and... Um, and so I just hit this spot where a lot of my, a lot of my shoppers ended up doing other things. And then I just, I jumped into wholesale and that's kind of where I stayed. Um, and so, you know, being able to spend a large sum of money in one chunk with, uh, with the supplier, you know, buying a hundred units of the same thing instead of one of a hundred different things, you know, it, it is nice to, to be able to do that. Um, and people do that with RA as well. You know, it's just, it's all about relationships. We we're kind of talking about that before we started, right? Um, so FBA insiders came along, um, about three years ago where we were doing a Q4 group. I was still doing RA at the time and we wanted to share, uh, retail arbitrage leads with people. And that, that's kind of how this got started. Q FBA insiders was only supposed to exist for three months and then stop. <laughs> and we ended up doing it. 
uh, for three months doing this leads group, teach people how to do RA during Q4. A lot of people loved it. And they said, hey, you're not going to cancel, are you? And we were like, I guess not. If y'all, if y'all like it, we'll keep going. And so we kept going. And here we are three years later with all these different services. We can talk about all that stuff that we do uh, there. And then I started my prep center uh, in March of this year, uh, COVID month. So right as COVID was spiking and things were going off the cuff, I opened up a prep center. Um, and, and I like to say we're, we're going strong given the circumstances, you know, and, uh, and especially with, you know, COVID has pushed a lot of people, a lot of brands that were maybe not so much involved in Amazon. Now they're doing a lot more. Um, obviously the sales have spiked. I'm sure you've seen that we had Christmas in May, (laughs) you know, with these crazy, crazy sales, um, consumers being forced basically to shop online. So yeah, so I have that prep center now, um, and we do we only do wholesale and private label. And one of the main reasons for that is um, one, that's my wheelhouse. But two, our sales tax I'm in Louisiana, our sales tax is almost ten percent. And if you're doing OA, you don't want to ship your stuff to us. You want to ship it to a tax free state. Um, yeah. And and you if you're if that's where you're at right now in in this, then I would say just quick Google <laughs> tax free states prep centers, and you'll find a lot of them. Uh, but yeah, so. Um, that's a little bit of my journey. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving a lot of details out, you know, doing this for five years. It, it seems like a, a lifetime, but it's a pretty short time in reality, you know, but it moves quick. Yeah. Internet years, it's a long time. It's like decades, but uh, in reality, uh, it's pretty short. It goes by so quickly. Yeah. Uh, our, our journey has some parallels in that I started with retail arbitrage and I I added some private label in the middle there before going into wholesale. So I've got some failures in private label, but got my start in retail arbitrage, which I think is still a pretty good way to kind of learn the ropes on Amazon. Um, there's a lot of barriers to it, but uh, if you can get around those barriers, you can learn the systems without using very much risk or putting up very much money. Um, and just learn how to put those stickers on and all those basic things that, you know, a lot of people just kind of take for granted uh, once you've been in this for a little while. Right, right. Yeah. And, and I still believe it's a very viable model. Um, my partner that runs the retail arbitrage group with me, her name's Tony Barnes. Um, I think she just did 2 million uh, in sales for, and that's 100% RA. Wow. You know, and uh, she's got a team. Um, I, I know other people that are doing just as much, if not more than that. Um, I know moms that are selling, you know, a hundred grand a month on Amazon doing RA, you know, involving their kids. Like, it's still a very viable thing. I think with what I always tell people is like, what do you enjoy? Do you want to be behind a computer for a long time sourcing? Do you like spreadsheets? If you don't like spreadsheets, wholesale is not for you, Mm -hmm. you know, like, do you like being out in the stores? You know, some people love that. Um, some people love building teams of people and having like local people in their area. Um, you know, it, what's your scenario? Are you in your house? Do you like people in your house that work for you? Like there's all these different scenarios that you have to think about as you grow and scale. And, um, you know, for me, I, I would say I'm a lifestyle entrepreneur. You know, I'm more after like, I'm in my home office in my garage, mm-hmm. you know, I and I walk out of here and I go into, you know, to see my kids after like, that's what I'm after. Uh, other people are after traveling. Well, if you want to be in Thailand, you can't do RA, you know, or it's going to be very difficult, you know, to have a team of people do that. So it all, de- all depends on, on what they're after. And, and I'd say all models are viable and all have hurdles. It just depends on what hurdles you want to climb, you know, yeah. what you want to go after. Yeah. hundred percent. There's good and bad for, just about every model out there. Uh, Why don't we dive into the retail arbitrage? We haven't talked about that a lot on the podcast. Uh, So let's dive into what you guys actually do there and the opportunities uh, that people have available to them. Yeah, awesome. So um, we have, uh, and this is our our longest standing product or service, if you want to call it that, um, where it's a, uh, a monthly subscription. You could do one month, three month, or six month subscription to a private Facebook group. Uh, and that Facebook group comes with, at, as of the time of this recording, three years of data and information and courses 
and the price has never changed. <laughs> like we just keep piling information in. Um, and so we have people jump in for a month and they get what they need and then they jump out. And then we have people that jump in for a month and then they stay for like 18 months. You know, they'll, they'll be there for a while. And so it depends on where people are at in their journey. But what we provide is basically this complete suite of helping people get from wherever they're at in their Amazon journey with retail arbitrage to where they want to be. So if they're currently just starting and they need to get approvals for brands, right? That's a, one of the biggest hurdles with RA. Uh, we help them with that. We have guides on how to do that. If people are selling $10,000 a month in RA and they want to bump it to $50,000 a month in RA, we help them do that. Um, at that point, it's probably good to get ungated in Nike and Adidas. We have those services available. So there's a, in the group, it's this kind of a la carte. Where, where are you at? What do you need help with? Um, we also have a team of eight professional Amazon sellers scattered throughout the country that are posting deals. So when you get this group, it comes with, we say 200 leads a month, mm -hmm. plus about $3,000 of value in training. So, and that, that comes for $149 a month. Um, people have said like, you're crazy for doing that. Like, I know, but that's like, this is the, our, our kind of our flagship, what we started with. And we truly, you know, and you know this, Todd, you wouldn't be doing this if you don't enjoy helping people. And so that, that's definitely one of our goals there. But uh, the 200 leads a month come from actual Amazon sellers, not from VAs overseas. It's not an OA list, although we do offer that as well. Um, but these sellers are actually grabbing items off of like Walmart shelves, Walgreens shelves, Home Depot, wherever, putting it in their cart and then sharing that product with the people that are subscribed to that. And, uh, and so, you know, there's all the data there. And then what's cool is people can ask questions like, Hey, why did you buy this product? Like one thing we don't share in there is sales ranks and people are like, well, it's a list. You should sell, you should share the rank. And the reason we don't share rank, especially with RA is because as you know, if you're doing this for a while, you can look at a keep a chart and be like, Oh, well the, the there's no sale. The, the rank is a million because it's been out of stock for four months. Yep. But whenever it was in stock, it was 50,000 in grocery or whatever, you know? And so that's one of the reasons why we don't share ranks is we want to teach people how to think for themselves, how to analyze the data. And so the tagline is we give them, we give them fish and we teach them how to fish. So our goal is to set people like sailing on their way. Like you don't need us anymore and we've served you along the way, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, if they want to go from RA to wholesale, we have that option. We can, you know, we can jump into that. But, um, you know, so we go into deep into Target, how to source uh, clothing and shoes with confidence, how to really master Walmart. Um, and, and, you know, Amazon changes, you know, as quick as we change our underwear. So there's always things coming up uh, and issues. And we talk about those issues. We do live calls. We do giveaways. Um, people can actually share deals with us. And we'll pay them for those deals. Um, our deal posters aren't just volunteering. They, they're paid. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask that. What is yeah. the motivation? Yeah, so there is no... So, you know, Bolo groups, it's like, hey, you join and then you might be required to share or whatever. Um, you know, in our group, um, we really take this, like, this approach where when you pay to join, you shouldn't have to do any work. In the sense of, like, you know, adding value to the group or things like that. Like, I've created a team around this group that adds value constantly, you know, people creating content, sharing the latest stuff about Amazon. Um, and, and just, you know, if there's a, somebody asks a question, there's uh, people that are selling well over a million dollars on Amazon and retail arbitrage that are answering those questions. So it's kind of like this group coaching environment where it's a support group, there's deals being shared and all that kind of stuff. And so if you look on our, on our website, if you go to the retail arbitrage tab, people can see a demo of how the deals are delivered. And this is pretty exciting because it's an iteration of what we used to do. We used to share the deals on Facebook. And as you know, Facebook's algorithm changes like uh, we change our underwear. It's just, you know, forever, like, how do you get the thing that you want people to see in front of them? So I took the deals, put them on our own website, and now people have an account that they log into. So when they walk into Walmart, they can check the Walmart box of all the Walmart deals that we've ever posted. And it sorts them by date of the most recent. And they can walk around Walmart looking for these products. And, and that's, you know, it's pretty, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. I've gotten some really great feedback about it. 
Um, okay, cool. I, I will share one of the things, probably the biggest issue that we have with the group is a lot of people think that, oh, well, I joined this group. And so therefore I should just be handed inventory on a silver platter. Mm -hmm. And there's no service out there on Amazon like that. And if it is, you're going to make like 5% return on investment. Like it's not going to be a value. Um, and, and so what we teach people is here's products you can go and find at Walmart or wherever. Um, if you don't find that exact same product, but maybe you're in a new section of the store, it would behoove you to scan that area. Like if we give you a blue Power Ranger, don't pass up the black and the yellow and the red, like scan all of them. Look for bundles, look for multi-packs, like we, you know, title search, all of that kind of stuff. So we go through all that training. Um, we even have some like in-store shopping videos and all that kind of stuff. Well, let's dive into a little bit of the, the nitty gritty of retail arbitrage. What are people actually out there doing and looking for to be successful? So you mean like what kind of products? Yeah. Are they just going to like the clearance aisle and looking for clearance items mm -hmm. or are they scanning an entire aisle or what is the process that you guys recommend to find good products to sell on Amazon in retail arb? So I would say that depends on like category to category and store to store. So what we're teaching is like, so for example, Walmart, everybody has them and uh, one of the issues with Walmarts is that the items get flooded quickly, prices tank quickly. So how to avoid that? So that's one of the things that we would teach. Uh, let's see, give you an example. Um, Christmas pajamas. If you're listening to this, uh, you probably missed the buck uh, this time of the year, but maybe put it in your hat for next year. Uh, Christmas pajamas from Walmart. So, you know, they're licensed. Okay. So like Paw Patrol, uh, Disney, things like that. So rule number one, get gated in Disney, in Paw Patrol. So we'll teach how to do that. Um, and then once you're ungated, how do you source clothes? Okay, so sourcing clothes is just scan, scan, scan. Like you're not going to be title searching clothes. Maybe you will, but it's going to take you forever <laughs> to do that. Um, when you say title searching, you're talking about typing in the name of the product rather than just scanning the UPC. That's right. And that, so I kind of say scanning is, is lazy man sourcing a little bit. You know, most people are just going to scan, scan, scan. Oh, if it doesn't come up, well, whatever. So what we'll teach is like, let's say you're on the grocery aisle and you're looking at seasonal candy. I'm not being specific about a category or a product because we share all categories and all products. Bras from Kohl's you know, clothes from wherever we even share Nike and Adidas every once in a while. And we share, like we, we try to hit across the board. One of the biggest questions we get is, Oh, I'm not engaged in anything or, or how do I know I'm going to be engaged in the things you post that you won't until you try. And then if you're not, let us help you get engaged. Like mm -hmm. that. Don't just look at that as like, ah, I'm just going to throw my hands up and not do anything. Like, no, like look at that as a challenge to, to jump over because we've all had to do it. If you're going to play this game, if you're not going to play the RA game, then, you know, do, you know, just do wholesale or whatever it is. So with the, like with title searching, there's like, we talk about apps like Scoutify or scan power. Um, we definitely recommend using third party apps to do that instead of seller central seller central. If you have like a typo at all, it's not going to pull it up, but Scoutify will pull up or scan power will pull up a host of different variations and ASINs. Yep. Scout so you, what I used back in the day. That one works yeah. good. Yeah. Still great app. And they've done a lot of improvements over the years. Um, and so what we teach is like, find those subsequent listings. You know, like if you scan some Reese's candy, that's a Christmas theme and a single pack comes up and Amazon's on the listing. Well, just title search that and look for a three pack or a six pack. Um, you know, look for a bundle. Maybe, maybe there's, uh, a, a dark chocolate and a white chocolate. Somebody made a bundle piggyback on those listings. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we teach is looking for those hidden listings and, and finding those because more than likely they're going to have a lot less sellers on them. Because if you had to hunt for it and it took you 30 seconds or a minute in the store to find it, more than likely a lot of the people aren't doing that. Yep. And so that is a huge advantage that you have versus just scanning and you go, Oh, well, I'm going to be first for the punch. And then there's 200 other sellers that said that. And now you're all just trying to get your pennies back out of the product. Yep. 
Yeah, so, I, it, it's always the case with just about everything. The harder something is, the more profitable it's most likely going to be because most people are not going to put in that work. Yeah, and that's a mindset thing. And you know, people look at hard things to go, oh man, this is too hard. I'm just going to try to find something else. And the people that say, oh, this is hard, there's a gold mine on the other end of this and I'm going to find it. And that tenacity to like, and you have to do that with whole, with any of these, wholesale, OA, RA, like if you try to take the easy road and, and it's like, oh, it's, it's not working, prices keep tanking, whatever, it's like, well, that's an opportunity to learn from mistakes. Why do they keep tanking? What can you do different next time that will make it better, you know, uh, down the road? And so... And, and look, I've lost lots of money on Amazon. Um, I would say I'm probably, every, every time I do lose money, I chalk it up to paying for education. Um, and I'm probably up to about a doctorate degree in selling on Amazon at this yeah. point. Um, but, but I've learned. I still do it. I still make plenty of money doing it. It's just learning and, and sticking with it. And, and I've seen a lot of friends that don't do it anymore because they're like, ah, oh, it got too hard, whatever. It's like, well, that's just one less competitor. But it's also like, I think it kind of shows the character of a person. When I coach people, I'm like, I'm going to try to talk you out of this <laughs> because it's not the it's not an easy road, you know. But it's a rewarding one. I get to walk out of the store and go hang out with my kids at 11 o'clock and take them to the park. Like that is worth it to me to go after this. And so RA, OA, wholesale, they cannot get you there. And uh, I know I'm kind of going on a tangent, but um, You're right. But uh, I think yeah. one point there is really important. Um, there, because a majority of people, everybody wants to do this, you know, internet business and, and try to have their own business. So a lot of people do, and everybody's traveling along and in the beginning, it's easy, it's fun, you enjoy it, but there always comes a time where you just reach it and you're like, well, this sucks. This is hard. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And that's where a super majority of people just give up. And maybe that one, two, three percent that push through that and actually become successful. So I, I think it's important that people understand that at some point that is going to come. Mm -hmm. And it's all about whether you push through that or just give up. And if you give up, then you're going to go try something else and you're going to reach that same point at some point over there. And that's why you get people who jump from one thing to another, to another, or another, and never find success because every time they run into that difficulty, they're just giving up and saying, well, this doesn't work. Nobody's actually making any money in this. Right. And I think on the other hand, you know, I've been listening to the book Atomic Habits uh, lately. I don't know if you've, if you've read that or listened to it. I uh, have not read it, but I've heard it's really good. Phenomenal. One of the things that he talks about is, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues with business is boredom. Mm -hmm. Once you, once you're bored or, or any, any skill, like you think of an Olympian athlete, you know, the guys that become the Olympian athletes are the ones that can tolerate the boredom because like with, with all of this, it's so repetitive. People yeah. ask me all the time, like, man, you must really love selling Amazon. It's like, not necessarily. It allows me to do what I want to do like any, any business. However, um, it's, it's what you make of it. Right. And so if I can tolerate the boredom, if I can, search the spreadsheet when I don't feel like searching the spreadsheet, or if I can hit the store when I don't feel like hitting the store, it's just like exercise. If I can hit the gym when I don't feel like hitting the gym, the person that shows up, those are the people that win. And that's something that we all can control. We can all show up. And you know, like even today, I'll be honest, I was like, I don't really feel like doing a podcast. Right? Like I just, I wasn't feeling it, you know, but I'm like, but I showed up and I'm glad I did. I'm here. This is fun you know, meeting a new friend and, and, and stuff. And so it's, and, and I don't know how you teach that, you know, like I think a lot of it is support, you know, like the, one of the biggest things with, with FBA insiders, we provide a lot of support because especially it, it's, it's lonely running the, you know, if you, if you have two friends that sell on Amazon that live in your area, like you're lucky. Most people have, you know, no one to really talk to about this kind of stuff. And so joining a community, having friends to talk with, jumping on the phone, adding value to their life, helping them first, not waiting for you to be helped, you know, first, like just those basic things, yeah. man, it really creates that environment of success and, uh, and, and just in pushing through. And so, um, 
you know, and on the flip side, you were talking about that there's the 2% or 3% that push through. And let's say the other 97% that don't, um, I would say, you know, that that's, that's sad because many people they're in that nine to five, they want to leave the nine to five and then they settle for the nine to five. It's like, Oh, I tried and it didn't work. And it's like, no. And so now you're going to live the next 30 years, like, you know, doing a job that you don't want to do, like, that's, that's sad, you know, like what, and, and that to me, that's so motivating. Like I want to be doing something that allows me to do what I want to be doing, you know, spending time with my family, go, you know, getting to travel, those types of things. And, um, you know, being benevolent, all that stuff. And, and to me, money's a tool, right. And, and if we can have an open hand with that, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that can happen. So I'm getting more philosophy stuff, but, you know, all, retail arbitrage, OA, wholesale, selling on Amazon, selling on the internet, it's a tool. And, it'll, and, and I think it helps us meet our goals. And so it's, what are those goals? For me, I wanted to come home with my kids. Some people might want to be a vagabond or whatever. Yep. Finding your why. It's very That's important. It. We talked about that before. And yeah, without that, a reason to keep doing it when you hit those roadblocks and get bored and stuff, then you're just going to give up if you don't have a why to keep moving forward. You're exactly right. I mean, I can't tell you how many times when I was starting to sell on Amazon and trying to go from part-time to full-time that I had so many doubts in my head of like, is this, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Is this going to work? And then having like in the back, I mean, thoughts of like, okay, if this fails, then I can go landscape. Or if this fails, I can go be a, a, wait, a waiter. <laughs> or if this, like all these wild thoughts are just like, I'm just waiting for the, for the ball to drop, you know? And it's like, man, if I just lean into it, be confident. Like I remember the first time I bought 10 units of the exact same thing in a Marshalls. It was like these halo Lego sets. And, uh, and it was like, I, I felt like, like I've always went really wide with my purchases. Like I wouldn't buy more than two of something. Um, and I bought like 10 of the same thing. And I was like, Oh, the sales rank is really low. All the data is not enough. I, I mulled over it for like 20 minutes in the store and I did it. And they all sold in the same day. And I was like, why did I question myself so much? You know, like I know the data, I know how to read it. Like what I really teach people today is like, whether it's RA or whatever, you want to be a master at reading a keep a chart, you know, yeah. like exactly. that's a huge thing that we talk about in all of these groups. And it's like, really, I'm a professional keep a chart reader. That's the way I look at myself. Like I can just, I can read the charts like the back of my hand. And right now they're going crazy like a lot of them aren't showing data. How do you get historical data? What do you do with all that? Um, and so, you know, but with that, it's like, once you know how to do that, there's a lot of confidence that you can have in your purchase, obviously within reason, right? Don't go crazy and buy 10,000 of something and hope yeah. that it works out. Yeah. You um, can't fully predict the future from the past, but you're going to have a pretty reasonable idea. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, so like with wholesale, one of the things that I teach is like on your first order, super conservative, you know, like don't get crazy. I've done it before. Didn't work. <laughs> like the times that I, that I was like, Oh, I'm buying 300 of this thing. It's going to blow out the water. And then I buy 300 and then, Oh, Amazon just decided to sell the brand, you know, mm -hmm. and there goes the buy box. Um, yep. You always, that first purchase is always like maybe a case or a couple cases to, you have to get your own data, no matter how much you think you understand the keep a graph, you never know what will actually happen until it's in there. I literally told somebody that like two days ago, I was like, your data is the best data. Yeah. Keepa is a tool. All these, you know, jungle scout, they're all estimation tools. And that's just it. Remember that it's a tool. It's not, you know, Bible truth. It is just a tool. And um, you know, use it to your best ability because they all waver. Like, you know, some of them really high estimation, some of them are low meet in the middle, you know, and, uh, and just get your own data. Like, and what I like to look at is my daily sales. Okay. Today I sold three yesterday. I sold, you know, four the day before that I sold one and get those averages. Okay. On average, I'm selling two a day. That's 60 units a month. I'm going to order 60, keep that 30 day supply rolling. And, and that, that's how, you know, how that works. Yes. So let's, uh, let's roll into wholesale since we're starting to talk about it. Um, you sell in wholesale yourself as well. What are your targets and what do you train people to do in that area? 
it mean it varies so much. You know, I would say the most common things that you hear: thirty percent ROI minimum. Um, some people go lower than that. Some go twenty. Um, personally, for me, I like to stay fifty percent ROI and higher. Um, and I've done a pretty good job with that. Um, it depends on how much capital people have, you know, uh, and where that with that. Um, in terms of the supplier. You know, we really promote small to mid-sized brands where uh, that you can pick up the phone and you might get the owner, or maybe it's a team of you know of twenty or thirty. Like I, I've got a supplier out in Georgia. I pick up the phone. I'm talking to the the owner's son, you know, and I, I pay over the phone. They and this is my favorite is when they ship direct to Amazon. Um, I don't recommend that for everybody uh, if you're just starting out, but. I've got probably a handful of suppliers that I don't have to see or touch it. And it goes, and I just even go to a prep center and I own one. <laughs> it goes straight to Amazon. Uh, if you can do that, that's sweet. In terms of, of the parameters though, I try to keep a pretty open, open window. It all depends on the category. Like, like we were talking about earlier, you know, do you want to put forth the, the effort of correcting listings or, you know, things like that? You know, if, if you're willing to do some extra work, then your parameters can go a lot wider. If you don't want to do any extra work, then you then you're on a pretty narrow narrow path. Um, you know, distributors are are good. Um, I think it it helps people cut their teeth. But um, it's to me, it's glorified online arbitrage uh, is is buying from a distributor. You have permission, that's good. So you shouldn't get IP complaints. Ideally, uh, depending on the distributor, some of them just sell you stuff when they're not supposed to. Um, it, but uh, you know. Ideally, what, what we try to teach is, is help people lock in a corner, right? So building those relationships with brands. Um, again, more on the, the philosophy level, if you're relational with people, um, obviously, they want you to spend money with them and they want you to, they want you to pay on time. You know, if you're going to ask for like 30-day net terms, pay on time, you know, like that kind of stuff. And so building those relationships is something that I've really done quite a bit of. And it served me, you know, over time. I'll never forget when I got my first exclusive. Um, I really focused on educating the brand owners, and uh, it was this uh, skin cream. And uh, this guy, he, you know, him and I kind of hit it off in the beginning. It came out of Canada, and uh, he, w I gave him these projections, like, "Hey, well, we should sell about 300 units a month of this cream, um, based off of all the data that I've got." And um, and so I ordered. Um, I don't know, half that, half that amount or that much. I can't remember how much I ordered, um, but I, I didn't reorder for a while. And he calls me, he's like, Hey, why aren't you buying the inventory you said you were going to buy? And I was like, well, you're selling to three other Amazon sellers. And let me just share with you how Amazon works. There's a buy box, there's rotation. I'm not going to get the velocity that I told you I could get because these other sellers are selling Amazon. He's like, Oh, well, I'll just sell to you then. I'm like, Oh, all right. Great. Yeah, it was that easy, you know, like, um, and, and then we did some listing, you know, optimization stuff together and, and some different things. And, um, and that was another product that it went straight from Canada into Amazon. Like it, it didn't go to a prep center or anything. And, uh, okay. you know, it, it's nice to spend 30 minutes on an order that generates a thousand dollars in profit, you yeah, know, for um, sure. it's available. It's out there. So. Yeah, what's what's really nice about distributors is that you can get such a large uh, variety of products. Uh, so sometimes what I'll even do is I'll open up accounts with distributors. Um, maybe their prices are good enough, maybe they're not. But in either case, you can then look at those individual brands that they're selling mm -hmm. and perhaps open up an account direct with the brand. Mm -hmm. um, you can also negotiate pretty good prices with distributors as well. I've got some distributors that um, I've opened up accounts direct with the brand, but their price is that the brand direct is like pennies lower than the distributor. So it actually makes more sense to just buy from the distributor because then I can buy in larger bulk and you know save on shipping and stuff like that. And, and as you grow in wholesale, like talking with Scott Needham of Buy Boxer, which they're doing like 60 million a year, they they almost can't buy from brands because to make sense for them, they have to buy in like semi truckloads. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They can't make like a one thousand, two thousand dollar order with a brand because it's just not worth their time. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and it just it depends on again, like we we're talking about with capital. You know, if you've got endless capital, like Scott does, yeah, semi truck loads. You know, and there are. It depends on the brand. You know, like probably I would imagine in his situation, he can go after the larger brands. Oh yes. You know where he can he can say, hey, we'll we'll buy ten million a year from you. And and lock in a contract or or whatever. Um, so it just it depends on on your scenario and where you're at. And and definitely with distributors, there's there's money to be made. Um, it just depends on the landscape of Amazon. And I, I know you see this where brands are getting savvier and they want to go direct, right, to Amazon, or they want to have some exclusive sellers. Buying from a distributor often doesn't create that relationship with the brand, um, and so it, it's challenging to to do that if that's the end goal, right? And, and everything that I do, I want to try and lock it in uh, as securely as possible. Nothing's one hundred percent secure, right? Things can always happen, um, but uh, to do that as best as possible. So when building relationships with brands, um, for example, if you're selling from a brand, maybe they're they're selling to ten Amazon sellers. Smaller brands, what they tend to do is they just go, you know what? I'm really tired of dealing with all these sellers. Why don't I just sell to like three? And you want to be on that cutoff line mm-hmm. at that three or at that five or whatever they choose. Then, and to hear the brand owner say, we're not taking any more Amazon sellers. You know, it's, it's sad to be on the side of the coin where you're like, ah, I missed the, missed the buck. Yeah. But it's awesome to be on the inside of that because you're like, man, I got this thing on lockdown. My sister sells $50,000 a month on Amazon from her house, raising three babies. She's pregnant with her fourth and from one supplier because she got in early, locked it in, and has exclusives on several different products. And I'm like, I taught her how to sell on Amazon. I'm like, how did you do that? You know, like that, that's it's kind of this, this too good to be true, you know, but my sister's one of those people that's good at everything she does and it's really annoying. And, but she did that scenario, it's like, but this is out there for the taking. Like if people can realize like these things are available, but the only way that you get that to happen is by being there, by pushing, calling companies, getting on the phone, you know, or, or just, you know, sending out emails, whatever it is, um, and, and locking those things in. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it definitely, it, it all depends on, on the, the brands that you want to go after and, and where you're at. So I wanted to share this story. We're talking about distributors. Um, I actually was trying to get a distributor locally here in New Orleans to send product direct to Amazon for me. And uh, this is about a 60 employee company. And I haven't, I, I called this rep and he was like, you need to talk to the owner. I was like, no one says that normally when it's like, Hey, can you ship to Amazon for me? I was like, okay. So I actually drove down there, met the owner. Uh, turns out he's fourth generation owner of this company. It's about a hundred year old company. And he's like, man, I've always wanted to sell on Amazon. I would love to learn how to do this. And I was like, a lot of people want to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and he actually was already selling to people that sold on Amazon. So he's a, he got about a 30,000 square foot warehouse. So he was selling them maybe three or four Amazon sellers at the time. And, um, and so anyways, long story short, we actually formed a partnership uh, where we're 50% owners of an Amazon account together. And now I have access to 30,000 square feet of product uh, with this guy. And so I brought the value to Amazon. He brought the value of the product and all of these super long relationships with these brands. I mean, brands that they've been buying from for 50 plus years. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't bring that to the table, but he can. And so it was just this really good marriage, not to mention we get along really, really well. Like that's super important for business partnerships. But um, yeah, we've, we, you know, our, our first year, I think we sold like 600 grand. And, and this is like side project. Um, and so it's like, you know, always for me, I'm always, I'm an opportunist, always keeping my eyes open of like, okay, what, how can I pivot? Another example, private label. I've created private label products from wholesale brands, you know, like generic products. There's no, no name on them or anything like that and, and made my own brands. And so my ROI went from 50% on these products to 150% or 200% in some cases, because I was able to increase the value. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely one thing that's kind of fun with wholesale is that you see a lot of products that maybe they're selling really well, but the listings are really bad and there's no other like good competitors. And you can find some really good ideas for private label brands just being in that world for sure. Yeah, cool. wholesale and and opening up an account with someone, that's another really good way that people uh, can do this Amazon game. Obviously, you need to know the the world and be the expert bringing it to the other person. But that way, I'm, I'm guessing that you probably don't even have to pay for the inventory. He's just sending it all in and you guys are like splitting the profit. That's right. Yeah. So um, we actually, we started um, basically, yeah, sending the inventory in. We tested it under my account for about six months, making sure it was a good relationship. I showed him the numbers. Uh, biggest thing is trust, right? In these scenarios. So to establish that, and then, um, and yeah, so now we, we buy the inventory together. Um, and, uh, you know, so we each put, uh, eventually we put a, a large, you know, let's say large, we each put a, a sum of money into a pot to say, Hey, we're going to put fuel to this fire. We're going to buy more inventory, um, pay ourselves back and then just keep the thing going. And so we paid ourselves back rather quickly. And now we're just playing with the house's money and just growing it, growing it, growing it, growing it. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the biggest things with, with Amazon. Um, earlier I was talking about retail arbitrage going full time. I went full time three times, uh, because of just different scenarios that happened. And, uh, one of the biggest issues is not having enough capital to keep the revolving door going, you know, like being able to leave that money in and, and safely keep growing that capital, uh, is difficult and life happens, right? You know, Oh, I need a new car or, you know, medical bills or whatever. And it's like, Oh, pull that investment capital out. And now I have no money to buy inventory or less money to buy inventory. And now you're back at building that, that thing up. And, uh, it, it's, just, it's hard. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I tell people, you know, leaving the, the nine to five is like, if you can tolerate your nine to five for a good year, year and a half while you're building the Amazon, you'll be so much more in a better scenario you know, as you built that up, um, you know, versus like, I hate my job. I quit. I'm going to go make money on Amazon. It's like, how much money you got in your savings? Thousand bucks. Oh, well, <laughs> you're going to be right back at the job. You know, like it's, it's difficult. It, it is, you know, but it's, it's doable. It's just, you know, teaching basic math of like, you can't just take all the money and the inventory and live off of that. You know? yeah, and it it kind of depends on what part of your life you're in too, right? You have kids, um, you're married and everything, and I'm married. So if I was to fail, I have a lot farther to fall than some college kid who's sleeping on their friend's couch. Yeah. You know, so that's actually an advantage of that broke yeah. college kid sleeping on someone else's couch because you can take a lot bigger risk uh, than someone else and have less to lose if you fail. So um, some people might look at that as a disadvantage, but you can also see it as a, an advantage as well, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. No, I was telling somebody the other day, I wish I found Amazon when I was a college student. Like that was 2006 to 2010. And I'm, so like, man, if I would have found it then, whew, that's so early to be getting in on that. Um, I, I have a, a client uh, at my prep center. He's been selling Amazon for 15 years. And like he was, he was one of the guys that like got the email from Amazon. I was like, hey, do you want to uh, opt into FBA? We're starting this thing called FBA. You know, it's like, man, to get in that early, like that had to be such like so sweet. But then to see all the changes, right? Like it's, it's constant. Yeah, so, so where, let's uh, let's uh, segue into your prep center and talk a little bit about that. Uh, a lot of people are always looking for a prep center. Maybe they don't want to have the products at their house or touch the products themselves. Uh, what made you get into the prep center world? It's kind of a series of events that have happened, but I basically bought a um, a building. I was getting into commercial real estate investing, and I bought a building with a friend of mine. And it was sitting vacant. And I was like, well, I need space. I need warehouse space. Why don't I just move my business into our warehouse 
And I was like, I have all this space. I might as well prep for other people. And there came the prep center, you know, and, um, and, you know, I have FBA insiders, so there's a little bit of an audience there. And so, yeah, it was just a, another, you know, I'm after multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it was just another stream of an offshoot. And that's how pretty much everything's happened. Like Amazon's the hub and there's all these offshoots. FBA insiders is an offshoot. Cajun prep is an offshoot. Uh, my partnership with my friend, you know, doing the other uh, dis distribution products, that's an offshoot. And so looking for those streams that can be automated. So like the, the prep center, um, you know, we've got a, a team of six right now. Um, but man, it's incredible what they can pound out uh, in a day. You know, I mean, we got, we get some pretty large shipments in um, right now from a few clients and uh, you know, we, our turnaround time is about two days right now. Um, and I know some prep centers are like, 30 days, uh, depending on who you're working with and how jammed up they are and how much space they have and all that. So one, one huge advantage with my warehouse is space. We got a lot of it. Um, and so we can do long-term holds if we have to and, and storage and, and those things. So, um, yeah, so that's how it came about. You know, one of the biggest things with prep centers too, um, one of the, that a lot of people say is like, how do I know you're not going to like take my inventory, mm -hmm. you know, or go open up an account with my, my person. It's like, well, first off, if, if anyone can do that, any prep center can do that if they want to. Um, and so whoever you're working with, you want to make sure you trust them. Um, and, and so I would like to say that my rapport over the last, you know, three, four years being in the Amazon selling community and building that up and all that, like people that know me can vouch for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, and I would say whoever you're working with, get vouches from customers or, you know, other people that are using them and make sure that, oh, hey, there's five other sellers now in this listing that I was the only one of after I started using this prep center. How did that happen? You know, like, and I don't think that happens a lot, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, I kind of stay in my own bubble. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, that, that's how it came about. Um, and we built some really neat processes along the way um, and, and added some software. Um, yeah, well, I would say like, I don't know if this separates us a lot from other prep centers, but one of the things we do with client communication is we use Slack. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with Slack? Yep. Uh, so some people, you know, that come to us, they've never heard of it. Some people have, uh, but it's a really just great way for my team to communicate with the client and say like, Hey, there's an issue with this ASIN um, or, you know, like we are pretty adaptable. We take photos of inventory if we need to, um, you know, we're, we're really flexible because I've, I'm an Amazon seller. Um, you know, I, I, I know the game. I can help people out. You know, I kind of go farther than, um, you know, just talking about prep. If people need help with selling on Amazon, if there's an IP complaint issue, or, like we can talk about all those things um, with, with sellers. And so, um, yeah, that, that's how it came about. And uh, it's been, been a pretty fun journey. Yeah. And I, I like, I'm looking at your prices. I like how you have uh, mostly like flat rate prices, not a lot of like hidden fees and things like that, which is really nice. Uh, before we dive into that though, for my own uh, purposes, do you mind sharing what software you're using to run the, the prep center? Yeah. So um, we use Boxed, B-O-X-T. So have you ever heard of that before? Yep. I actually use that one. Yep. Okay. So, um, we've incorporated box, um, into our processes where it's our, it's a requirement for every client to have it. Um, and we actually get a, a prep center rate, which is, which is cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we, we make every client have that so that it just works with our processes. That's, it helps us man. like, you know, like if you've ever prepped with like only seller central or, even with just like, it's just, it's, it's just it's horrible building pallets. Terrible. Oh, it's terrible. So with box, well, we're super accurate with the box contents, the box level contents. And then we're also really quick with our preps. So the way that we've kind of like, we've got this flow that the way the inventory comes in our line and out the line uh, and all that. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we use. Um, uh, yeah, for, if anybody's interested in checking that out, that's, uh, Box to B O X T dot scan power dot com. Um, I use it to build my pallets. It's it's fantastic. It's the best thing I've found so far. You do get some errors from time to time, 
uh, that are kind of strange, but for the most part, it, it works really well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with us being a prep center, we have such a wide variety of product that comes in groceries, sports and outdoors, what, like whatever, it's all kinds of stuff, clothing. Um, but box is kind of like that central ingredient to that, mm -hmm. um, to, to all the inventory, you know, depends on what it is and, and the client and how much it is and all that, but boxes has dramatically helped us improve, uh, those processes. So, um, you know, I'd like to say we're, we're probably one of the fastest out there. Like we've even had same day turnarounds at times of inventory where it, like, if it comes in early enough, we can get on the line, get it out the door, uh, really quickly. So, um, so what about software for, um, like tracking the inventory in the warehouse Are you using anything special for that? Google sheets. Um, you know, we, we did, eventually I wanted to build out a dashboard, uh, on our site, but I mean, Google sheets is powerful enough and it gets the job done. Um, you know, you can see, so what we do is we have uh, a spot where people can drop in their inventory of, Hey, this is what's coming to you. Here's a title, ASIN, you know, a little bit, uh, some other information. And then we grab that and depending on the client, they'll either build out the shipment and sell it central, or we will build it out for them. And, um, and then we'll basically take it from there and ship it out. And so we let the client know, Hey, uh, this shipment was just, was just received. It landed. If there's any damages, we have to know about the damages. Um, and then, you know, if anything's expired, if it's grocery, whatever. Um, and then we create the shipment and then alert the client, Hey, uh, your inventory has been sent out and here comes your invoice. Yeah. It's, uh, we do a lot of custom pricing. So if somebody comes to us, they're like, Hey, uh, um, you know, we're doing 10,000 units a month. Um, like we'll, we'll obviously we'll, we'll give them a break there. Um, okay. or Hey, you know, all I have, everything I do is glass. Can you do some custom boxes? Like, yeah, like we're, that's what I'm, early when I'm talking about being adaptable and this is just not on Amazon or just business ownership one-on-one, like be adaptable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we can customize a lot of different scenarios, uh, for people, um, yeah, I love your your flat rate pricing, as I was saying. Um, and it looks, uh, from what I've seen, very competitive. Um, you've got a, a dollar an item for all the basic wholesale and private label stuff. And that includes poly bagging, suffocation warning, and all that good stuff. Um, you even do photos of damaged items or boxes, it says there. So, um, and then it looks like you have volume discounts as well, depending on how much, uh, how many units people are sending you a month. Yep. 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 So those percentages there, um, you know, it, and, and we can even, again, depending on what it is, like we've got some people that do a lot of small night. Uh, we don't have to dig into what small night is. Uh, but you know, for those clients, it's like, Hey, if you're doing like, if it's just F and labels and it's a lot of them, like we'll, we'll give you a big break. Uh, okay. on that. Um, but if your stuff's like a pain in the rear, we're probably gonna have to charge you for it. <laughs> it's that we can only do it so fast. You know, if it's like you want to do a three pack of glass jars, you know, that's just going to take some time. Um, but, uh, you know, what we can do though, for people that are sourcing, one of the biggest things when you're buying the inventory, you need to know your prep costs, you need to know your shipping costs, um, ideally and, and build all that in because, if you're working with a 30% ROI, well, after prep and shipping and inbound shipping, like, well, now it's 5% or 10% or whatever. And now there's no meat on the bone. Um, and, and so what we can do is have conversations with people. So on the website, you'll see there's a Calendly link there. Um, so people can book a call um, and get set up with us. And we have some onboarding docs that we'll send and lock in their pricing. And then they can go to town with buying inventory. Um, you know, because if you're thinking that your prep rate is $1.50 a unit, well, that 50 cents could really throw things off. You know, like if, if you could save that 50 cents on your prep, maybe that's a make or break for you. I don't know. Yeah. Um, especially when you multiply it by thousands of products, you know, it, it adds up. So, uh, -huh. yep. And I don't know if we mentioned the website for your prep center is CajunPrep.com. So if people want to Check it out. And you guys are in uh, Alabama, right? Louisiana. 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 Right. We are in Cajun Town. Okay. Uh, down here. In Louisiana. So. Um, and one thing that I have done a little bit of, I used to use just prep centers mostly. 
Uh, but now I have my own warehouse. Uh, I still use prep centers occasionally. And what I usually use that for are like big, heavier items that, uh, let's say I'm buying it from a supplier in North Carolina, uh, to ship that all the way to Utah can be quite expensive. So I've actually found like prep centers that are near those suppliers and just jump it over and then they can direct ship it into Amazon and even paying the prep fee and everything is still cheaper than paying that uh, shipping freight across the, the country. So that that's another way you can kind of utilize a prep center, even if you did have your own warehouse or maybe you're doing it out of your house or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, you're exactly right. Um, I did the same thing with a supplier I had in Ohio and like the prep center was 30 minutes away, mm -hmm. you know, from them. And, you know, I could ship a truckload to that prep center it didn't cost me anything you know, to get it to them, but to ship that down to Louisiana, same deal, you know, it's like, and I have to deal with it. Right. So there, there, you have to see like, okay, what's, what's worth it or not. Um, but it is funny that we both brought it back in house. Cause I did the same thing. I was a hundred percent prep centers and I was like, you know what? I, you know, I really think I can, I can bring this in house and do it faster, cheaper. And then also like, if you need to manipulate things more, like if you start getting into some really weird bundles and stuff and, you know, you got to be careful. Like sometimes communicating with prep centers can be difficult. Um, like the, I was talking earlier about the private label products I built from my wholesale brands. Um, these were three part kits. And one of the ingredients of it was, um, was a uh, cardstock paper cardstock. So it's like, okay, so this has to be packed just right. So some advice for you that are doing using prep centers, if you've got something that's sensitive, create a, an SOP of how to do the prep and just send it to the prep center. Just give this to your staff. This is how it has to be done. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, if somebody came to me and was like, Hey, here's an SOP for this. Here's how it needs to be done. Wonderful. Like that helps my staff so much. It's kind of like working with virtual assistants. Clarity is key. You want to have a lot of clarity with these prep centers of what, what you expect from them, what they expect from you. Um, you know, and, and, that will help all scenarios go by smoother yep. um, for sure. Yeah. And, and make sure you evaluate the prep center as well. You know, I'm sure you guys do an awesome job, but what I like to do if I'm going to work with a prep center is first um, like use their contact form to send them an email, uh, maybe ask some basic questions, you know, like uh, you know, how much would this style product cost the prep or uh, how long would it take for you to receive and send it back out? And even if those questions are on their website, I like to send some questions like that because I want to see how long it takes them to get back to me. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm a new customer and I'm going to be coming on and it takes them a week to get back to me, it's probably not going to be great uh, once I'm an actual customer and they don't care about me as much anymore. Um, and then I also like to get them on the phone, you know, after they maybe answer that initial email and everything looks good, get them on the phone, talk to them about their operations and stuff like that, and just see what kind of communication level. Cause that, that seems to be where most prep centers fall apart is their communication, uh, with the customers. And I've had that problem before where, okay, this shipment says it was delivered four days ago and nobody said anything to me. Did you guys get it or what happened? What's going on? Yeah. Uh, and that can be a real pain uh, when that communication is not there. Well, and, and those two things that you just mentioned, um, you know, that's exactly when I started the prep center, I was like, we're going to get things out quick and we're going to communicate. We're going to over communicate. They're going to be annoyed with us that we <laughs> give them so many alerts. Like yeah. that's what I want our customers to feel is like, man, they are, Johnny on the spot. And so I've got a, I got lucky. I have a really awesome manager that he's just really great with tracking all the data and, and all that. Like even in our, in our personal thing, like there's some KPIs that we track. One of them is items per man hour. And I want to look at those averages. Like, where are we at? You know, why was this day low? What happened here? And, and so like from an internal standpoint, we track things, but also for the customer, we want to track things. And so you're, you're exactly right. I mean, man, if you try to contact a prep center and they don't get back to you for three days, you're like, dude, I've got 10 grand with you right now. Like, please get this out the door, you know, or, or whatever it is. Like, and so we treat the inventory like it's our inventory, you know, like, and, and that's, and, and even when we're prepping things, we want it to be in giftable condition. We don't want to, 
be loosey goosey with it and, and stuff. And so, you know, there's from an internal standpoint of, of what every prep center does with their staff, how they treat them. Um, and I think you can kind of tell when you get the owner on the phone. And, and that's why like, I like to jump straight to a phone call. It's just have for 15 minutes. It's only 15 minutes for me. And, and for you, I think it could be make or break. You know, so it's like, let, let's talk on the phone. You can feel out who I am. I can feel out who you are. And, and there might be a thing where me as a prep center owner, I'm like, I don't want to work with you. If you're a jerk, I do not want to do business with you. You know, like there are, it goes, both ways. It, it goes both ways. We're both, we're being interviewed on both sides. And so, you know, from there, then it's okay, let's get you onboarded and, you know, communicate. And so, um, we always like to, to knock things out of the park, but, um, and two with Slack, I love it because I get, you know, it's on my phone and, um, you know, on one hand, I don't want to be ruled by my businesses, but on the other hand, if there's an alert that's urgent, I can catch it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and the prep center is not, you know, it's not like Amazon where it's, tw- where it's 24 hours, we're nine to five. You know? yeah. Um, so yeah, communication is definitely key. Uh, another little thing that I like to do that can be helpful is look up the address of the company on Google maps mm-hmm. and make sure it's actually like a, an actual warehouse on Google maps. Just another little way to kind of to verify that b- the business is probably legit because a lot of people are pretty nervous about that when they're sending product to a prep center and people they've never uh, met and things like that. So just doing the little things to kind of verify the business. So one thing um, that I would say about the address is I actually don't provide mine. And the reason being is because I don't want people to send me inventory that aren't set up with me. Sure. So, So that has actually happened where, you know, with other prep centers and stuff, it's like stuff just shows up and you're like, Who's is this? And you have no idea how to contact, like people just send you stuff. And you would think that's it's like, who would do that? I don't know, <laughs> but, but it's happened. And so that's why I like to, like I provide the address after the call. Yep. Um, yep. And so, you know, I, I, I get that methodology um, of like, make sure it's legit and things like that. And, and you know, yeah, it, it's definitely one way to that. That's just my, that's why I keep it off. And maybe I should put it on, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think as long as you give the address out, you know, to the people once they've contacted you, so they can kind of vet you a little bit. Yeah. If and maybe put a note. local chamber of commerce or something like that as well. Right. And, and I probably can even put a note on there of like, uh, don't ship us anything until you've been set up or something like that. Um, or, or just leave out the address number, you know, contact oh, you with a complete address. There you go. But then at least I'll know your street and city and everything. All that stuff. For yeah. sure. Sure. For sure. All cool. right. Cool. I think we dove into a lot of really good stuff in this. Um, if people uh, want your prep services, check out CajunPrep.com. Um, and then for your training and things, we set up an affiliate link for that. So they can go to EntrepreneurAdventure.com forward slash insiders. And that will take them over to your FBA Insiders page where if they're interested, they can learn about retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, wholesale. Um, And one thing that we didn't talk about, which we can touch on really quick, is your FBA VAs. So you've got... You you help hook people up with trained virtual assistants, correct? That is correct. Uh, So if people go to that tab, the FBA VAs, um, there is a questionnaire that you can fill out. And there's a whole host of things that a VA can help with. Um, so we have a full-time or part-time VAs that are available that are trained and it's all, you know, in Amazon, there's so much minutia, right. Of things that you, that just take up your time, handling customer messages, reimbursements, price alerts, stranded inventory, deleting old listings, mm-hmm. um, you know, feedback, all this kind of stuff. And so the VAs are trained to handle all of those things. Uh, So it's not so much sourcing as much as it is all of it like admin assistant type work. Um, All the busy work that is super important, but is not fun to have to be doing all the time. That's right. Now, I will say um, this is not on our website. It, It might be at one point. But one of the things that I actually did is I had a VA that was all this VA did was reach out to suppliers. That's like, he was trained on that. That's all he did. You know, 
five days a week. Mm -hmm. And I got inundated with so many suppliers that we couldn't keep up. It was like, we don't need any yeah. more suppliers. And the same thing. Let's just milk our, milk our brands that we have. And so um, I had this trained VA and I was like, man, I don't want to let them go. And so um, I had uh, you know, some other wholesale Amazon sellers. And I just was like, hey, is anybody interested in a, in a part-time VA one day a week um, to go and source for you? So you get four days out of the month. Um, and, and this is people that are kind of starting out. And, uh, and so, yeah, I got four other Amazon sellers doing one day a week with a trusted VA. And I was like, this is like, they, they've all been really happy with it. And, you know, for somebody that's starting out, especially if you're part-time, you don't have a ton of time to call people and reply to emails because all the VA is doing, sending the initial email, finding the supplier, and then you feel the response. So setting up the accounts and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, so um, that might be something that we, that we offer in the future as well. Cause that is, you know, once you learn how to, source for suppliers, you know, it is so time consuming to do constantly. And so, um, but you want that pipeline to stay filled with new fresh suppliers until you've built up a good, a good stash of people that you can buy from. So hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the VA service. Um, uh, we, we might, you know, I, I don't know, we'll see about doing the, the part-time VA for the wholesale sourcing, uh, here soon. Um, and yeah, and there's a shop page on a website with a lot of other like smaller mini courses and things like that. Like if you don't want to, you know, jump into any of the groups, you can just buy like some a la carte courses and, and things like that. Like one of the things we talk about is gift cards um, and, and buying discounted gift cards to really save money. Like when you're doing RA or even just personally, like if you want to go out to eat, you can buy a 20% off gift card from raise.com and save 20%. All right. Awesome. Well, Paul, this has been fantastic. Um, again, entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash insiders. If people want to check out what you guys offer over there and CajunPrep.com. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. I think this has been great. A lot of really good information. And uh, yeah, I hope you're... How's your Q4 going real quick? Oh, it's going, going well, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's been... I mean, there's whirlwinds, right? I mean having to deal with all these slow FBA check-ins, but yeah. make, making it work, you know? Good. Uh, so how about yours? Going well? Oh, fantastic. I'm setting records pretty much every day. So it's, awesome. it's been fantastic. Good stuff. Man. Amazon is definitely blowing up. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's funny because people often ask the question, is it too late to get in? No. I don't think it'll... I don't know if it ever will be because our our economy is forever changing. New brands are always popping up. New products are popping up. New, like there's always things evolving, you know, um, like I would say the biggest change, I don't know if you do merchant fulfilled. Um, that was the biggest, biggest change for us this year was, was doing merchant fulfilled. So having the, the warehouse is really helpful for that. Um, you know, but, um, that, that's, that's probably been the, the biggest thing this year, but I mean, it's again, rolling with the, with the punches and adapting and, Keeping it going. All right. Awesome, Paul. Well, I appreciate it. You have an awesome one. Great. Thanks for having me on. It was fun. This has been another episode of the Entrepreneur Adventure Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow entrepreneur. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.